Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us from wherever you are. I, I know that some of you are very far away, uh, including the middle of the Pacific Ocean and indeed the southern tip of Africa. Welcome all of you. And um, as, as you've no doubt read, um, we weren't planning on having this this afternoon, but we've had to do this because of the situation with the coronavirus. So it is with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce our president, Mr. Richard Stock, who's going to talk to us this afternoon about the Boer invasion of Natal and the siege of Ladysmith. Over to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody, from wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, presentation. I'm sorry it's so uh, impromptu, and uh, because of uh, circumstances, we've had to uh, make major changes, and there will unfortunately be some further changes to the re uh, remainder of the programme for this year. But more details about that in the next few days when we've settled every as much as we can. Okay, so the Republican invasion of Natal and the siege of Ladysmith. On the 11th of October, 1899, the Republican forces of the Orange Free State and the Transvaal invaded the British colony of Natal through three passes in the Drakensberg Mountains. They advanced rapidly, taking the towns of Newcastle, Glencoe, and Dundee. We are, of course, in South Africa and not in Northern England and Scotland, mentioning those names. Um, and the map on this page will show the difficulty that the British forces had being half the numbers that the Boers put into the field on this occasion in defending the northern part of Natal, that triangular section of land uh, with the Biggersburg and the Drakensberg Mountains on the, on the left and the Buffalo River uh, on the right. Christmas came early for the Boer forces because they captured the Dundee post office intact. So they got stamps, postal stationery, date stamps, everything that they could need to run a post office. And this particular item uh, I'm showing now is an item of mail in the Dundee post office, which was captured by the Boer forces. It's franked with a penny natal adhesive. Uh, it's addressed to Upper Norwood in, in uh, outer London and it was censored by the Boer forces uh, before it was forwarded. The Boers also um, introduced a, a series of hand stamps and a little bit more about that in a few moments. But there was one particular incident early on uh, in the period uh, running up to Christmas uh, in which uh, at Cheveley an armoured train was attacked by the Boer forces and Sergeant Parry, as I've noted here, distinguished himself by rescuing some, uh, an officer from the train. And Winston Churchill, who was aboard that train, was taken prisoner. And with Captain Haldane, were in, both imprisoned in a prison in Pretoria. Uh, they both escaped and Churchill managed to get to the Portuguese border and then returned home by a very circuitous route. The letter here, because of its contents, make, puts it in a category on its own. The cover on its own probably would be ignored by most postal history collectors. But looking inside, Sergeant Parry is writing to his mother about being called in April 1900 to give evidence about the armoured train disaster. Um, and Captain Haldane, who was in charge of it, uh, was now being court-martialed because he was responsible for being in charge of the train at the time that it was attacked by the Boer forces. The Boers had a particularly neat way of dealing with armored trains as one of their leaders, Christian de Vett, um, informed all his subordinate officers that the way to handle it is to blow up a section of track in front of the train and another section behind the train and then attack it. Um, British officers who were in charge of cavalry patrols felt that uh, armoured trains were something akin to a death trap because they were used to sending out mounted patrols who they felt did a much better job in getting the information uh, about the location of Boer forces 
than by sending an, an armored train, which was particularly vulnerable along a railway track. I mentioned a moment ago about provisional hand stamps that the Boers um, used. One at Colenso, which is near Ladysmith, uh, that particular straight line hand stamp was in use between Jan 13th of January and the 6th of February of 1900. The cover further down is an item of uh, captured postal stationery where the OHMS um, wording has been deleted. And this was posted at uh, the Ngogo railway station, which is on the line from Newcastle down towards Dundee. This covers a little more interesting because um, it's been redirected. The um, item that's displayed in the upper right part of the uh, screen, the PK Newcastle 17th of February, that is a hand stamp that was of a series that were created by the Boer forces, principally used in Newcastle. And it's one of several different types used there. It was also used at Glencoe, which is uh, nearby. Um, and those of us, I think, who were at school in the 1950s will remember um, a contrivance called a John Bull printing outfit. Uh, it was made up of loose type into a wooden holder and you used it to create symbols and lettering uh, in whatever way you wanted to. And uh, I think the PK Newcastle hand stamp is reminiscent of that because that was indeed made up from movable type uh, and put into a, into a wooden holder. This particular uh, cover is in Dorsfeld Dienst in field service, was sent from Pretoria to Newcastle and then redirected to uh, Modder Sprout. I called it Modder Sprout, but I was corrected. It's uh, Sprout, but not as in Brussels. Um, and it went to the Boer headquarters and then it was returned to Newcastle. So it has two examples of the PK Newcastle hand stamp on it and two strikes of the Boer headquarters, Ulflager. Uh, ZAR date stamp. Some years ago, I managed to obtain um, a, quite a quantity of uh, original photographs that were taken, and they were had previously been in the collection of Ken Griffiths, who was probably one of the form, who was the foremost collector of Anglo-Boer War postal history material. And the quality of some of the photographs is, is quite surprising. And this one shows the Scottish Rifles march marching into Escort, a town just to the southeast of Ladysmith in 1899. You can see here, there's a one of the soldiers looking backwards, obviously, uh, I wouldn't say he was smiling for the camera, but he's looking towards the, uh, uh, no doubt, a journalist who's taking a, the photograph at, at the time. The Boers produced a quantity of these oval hand stamps. They're usually in blue, uh, black or in purple, occasionally in red. This one at Danhauser um, was sent by a doctor who was interned by the Boers. Now, he had been treating some of the uh, Boers and therefore was given uh, privileges, including free access to certain parts of the town. So this cover was posted unsealed, addressed to Ireland, and it's endorsed open for inspection. So it was back stamped at Newcastle and sealed, but opened again and then resealed with a boar pink sensor label um, at Pretoria. Uh, the cover was then transferred back across the lines because it's got a Durban uh, date stamp of January the 15th, 1900. It's, I have to say, what, one of the favorite items in, that uh, I have in my collection. A similar item, and this time an envelope sent by uh, a Scandinavian volunteer serving with the Boer forces. There were many European uh, serving with the Boer forces, and also there was an American contingent as well. Um, and obviously they sent letters home. And this one is posted at Ingagani Field Post Office. And this time the date stamp is, is in blue black and on reverse is the blue hand stamp felt post AR, uh, ZAR Newcastle uh, and a date stamp of Pretoria and Stockholm. 
I've also got another item, which I, I'm not showing, but it's, it, it's to the same addressee and it pays the uh, postcard rate to, to Sweden. Two more items of a, of a similar nature, one posted at Keir Station, another one at, at Hatting Sprout, and both of those field post offices um, handled the mail for the Boer, Boer forces. The one to Keir, from Keir Station is going to Germany and the Hatting Sprout cover goes to uh, Switzerland. And I've mentioned there the dates on which the uh, Hatting Sprout uh, cancellation was used. Again, captured postal stationery card uh, taken at Dundee and also uh, cancelled with the Dundee cancellation that was part of the uh, items that fell into poor hands when they invaded. This also has the Feldboat G Fleischer uh, hand, hand stamp uh, in the bottom left hand corner for the 12th of March 1900. Now remember that the Dundee Post Office fell around the 13th, 14th of uh, October, 1899. So this is quite a late usage um, of uh, a captured uh, postal item. Moving then on to the Siege of Ladysmith itself, I think the diagram on the right does give an indication of the location of Ladysmith in relation to the point at the top near Charlestown, um, where the Boer forces invaded, came down via Lang's Neck, past Majuba. This was General uh, Joubert, towards Newcastle. They tended, I think, on in this instance, to follow the railway line. Um, and then the um, other detachments came in from Berta's Pass and Van Rienen's Pass. This was the Free Staters. And they came via Newcastle, Danhosa, Hatting Sprout, Glencoe, Dundee, on the route down towards Ladysmith. Now, Talana Hill is marked here just outside Dundee. There was a major engagement of the British and Boer forces at Talana. Um, the British were outnumbered. General Penn Simons, who had been um, engaged in the Zulu War in 1879. He was mortally wounded and his deputy, Colonel uh, Ewell, who was then became a brigadier, he retreated towards Ladysmith. So it's, the Boers put into the field something like 25, 26,000 men against the 12, 12 and a half thousand that uh, the British were able to field. And so it was inevitable that the British force fell back towards Ladysmith. So another engagement was at Ilenslagte, uh, and then the British troops retreated further into Ladysmith. The siege was not one of the uh, medieval type of sieges where one force disappeared into the castle, pulled up the drawbridge and withstood repeated attacks. The perimeter to which the Boers gave siege was something like four, five miles long. And uh, the postmaster in Ladysmith set up a separate postal service within the perimeter so that mail could be posted at one port part and delivered to across the other side of the perimeter to another section of the town. Um, the cartoon at the top indicates how everybody ran for cover when the first shell landed because the Boers occupied the hills surrounding Ladysmith and using their long tom howitzers um, repeatedly fired shells into the town itself. Mail can really be divided into three, set, three or four sections. Firstly, mail sent from Ladysmith before the siege, mail uh, detained in Ladysmith during the siege, um, and then mail sent after the siege. In addition to that, there are a number of what are called siege runner covers, and we'll come to those in a moment, um, plus the postcards and um, printed cards, especially for Ladysmith siege, uh, that were set up by the postal authorities. 
So start beginning at the beginning. This one's dated October the 13th. Um, and it was written on the, well, the date's written the 13th, but cross out and put 14th. But a note's been added that let us still go to Ladysmith. Um, and this uh, particular item is one of the last ones that, uh, that went out. I mentioned about the Boers shelling the town. Um, it was really rather vulnerable. And this photograph, again, from the um, Ken Griffiths uh, collection, uh, shows the shell damage that was done to uh, the town hall. Item then of mail trapped in Ladysmith by the siege. Uh, this cover to Durban from the United Kingdom was franked a penny with a penny lilac and cancelled on the 15th of uh, October. Now it was redirected to Ladysmith and arrived on the last mail before the town was cut off by the Boer forces. And it remained in the town throughout the siege and was then sent to Melmoth on the, uh, and arrived on the 6th of March after the siege uh, had been lifted. This is an item that I, I, I must uh, show to uh, people I know in the Great Britain Philatelic Society because it's quite a good usage of, um, of a penny lilac. I mentioned a few moments ago a siege runner cover. This is one such item. Some mail was smuggled out of Ladysmith by runners and taken posted at escort and a lot of the items that are available went to uh, Peter Maritzburg. I wasn't sure whether this was a siege runner cover because it's it's the only date stamp on it is Peter Maritzburg 9th of February 1900 which is during the siege and there's nothing to indicate that it was it was smuggled out other than the note that was put on it by um, someone that uh, it was posted at escort under cover to the postmaster of Peter Maritzburg on the 9th of February. So I did um, an internet search and came up with a dissertation that somebody was writing about um, Trooper Hart's uh, service, not only in the Boer War, but more particularly in the Bambata Rebellion in 1906-1907 in Zululand. And in it, uh, illustrated was a cover written by him at that time uh, in 1906 and posted, it's written in the envelopes written in the same handwriting and it's the same address to Mrs. Hart, who was Trooper Hart's mother. And I thought, well, that's good enough for me, but I've also obtained since then two covers in, it, in the same handwriting, both date stamp Ladysmith and both of them one of them is dated the 29th of um, February and the other one is, is the 6th of March, um, 1900. So immediately after the uh, siege was uh, raised, uh, was lifted rather, and um, they all tie in together. So this is clearly a siege runner cover. Um, there were obvious problems if anybody was caught by the Boers carrying an envelope with a date stamp uh, that occurred during the siege. Um, whilst the siege was still on. Uh, so uh, that's why I think some of these covers were merely smuggled out without any postal markings on them at, at all. And then you get an arrival mark on the envelope later. Okay, this item um, is from the Boer headquarters to Peter Maritzburg. It's endorsed Feldinst and with the Uflager uh, Ladysmith hand stamp the three line uh, item, which is much scarcer than any of the other, the Newcastle, um, PK Newcastle um, and Glencoe three line hand stamps. But the interesting one of, thing about this is that um, if you look at the illustration of the back of the envelope on the left hand side here, that you can see a, a small part of the Ladysmith 12th of November um, hand stamp. It has in fact been censored twice. This isn't completely, the officially sealed um, label here isn't stuck down completely on the envelope uh, and just lifting it gently you can see the 
Bohr sensor label underneath, which reveals the rest of the Uflaka uh, hand stamp, and then this officially sealed knot was placed on top of that. So it's been censored by both the Boer and the British forces. I mentioned earlier about the um, Ladysmith siege postcards. Um, it was thought at the time that these would become rarities and that uh, uh, people who were besieged in Ladysmith decided to send them examples of them to their friends, uh, thinking that they would like a, a souvenir or a memento of the 124 days siege. Um, I'm not very happy about the Ladysmith cancellation here on this particular uh, item. The field post office, British Army South Africa mark, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But you'll notice that the only part of the date that you see here is 21st of March, the year is missing. And it doesn't have the look of authenticity about it that uh, you would expect to see on a genuine um, hand stamp. So that might be uh, might be contrived. But these are, there are several different types of uh, postal card were prepared uh, and used, um, and they're not they're not rarities. Okay, continuing with the siege of Ladysmith, um, you see that. People got used to shells being uh, fired in, into the town. Um, and this cartoon is represents the last shell. Uh, people having tea, sitting down and generally being more relaxed about the whole thing to do with the siege. Um, they're expecting to be relieved. And the message on the reverse here indicates that about Buller will be in soon. That's uh, Sir Redvers Buller. He had a number of... Uh, not defeats, but uh, difficulties and um, reverses, as they were called at the time. So he was nicknamed by certain people and journalists in particular, not Sir Redvers Buller, but he was known as Sir Reverse Buller. Um, this is a Hapney Natal postal stationery card with the Ladysmith Siege Post Office uh, um, type of uh, cancellation, but there were several mistakes on, on, on some of these, the way the, the type wasn't put into the wooden holder correctly. So you've got the inverted H in 24th on this one. And I do have another one um, where siege is incorrectly spelt, uh, S-E-I-G-E. -E. Britain wasn't popular on the continent as far as the Boer War was concerned. And a lot of, uh, Pro Boer uh, humorous cards were prepared uh, by various continental countries. This one in Paris, Le Deblay Boer, um, and Kruger is depicted making a clean sweep of the British forces um, and with Mafeking, Kimberley, and Ladysmith uh, caged. This is a cover that is particularly tragic as far as Major Bowen is concerned. Um, he was killed in action on Wagon Hill on the 6th of January 1900, but uh, he wrote a 20-page letter which was sent uh, to his wife uh, on the 2nd of January 1900 and delivered after the siege. Um, and he wrote this letter on nine occasions between the 5th of November and the 26th of December with a further very short uh, message added in ink on the 31st of December that he was all right. And those were the last words that he wrote to his wife, it being the last day of the last century but one. But in it, he had various references to um, having to drink the water of the Clip River, which was very muddy and unpleasant, and he, you wouldn't let your dog drink it at home. He was fed up with the number of shells that were falling in the town. And he said that when he come, came home, he wants to sleep in his clothes on the path in the garden in a blanket. And if it's not raining, he wants someone to come and pour a watering pot over him every now and then, and the gardener to come out and shoot every hour or so in the night. So even though soldiers were besieged in, in Ladysmith, they did retain a certain sense of humor. And his gravestone is still on Wagon Hill. Um, well, it was five or six years ago. Um, 
in uh, South Africa. Okay, a couple more items um, of uh, Boer forces mail. The Uftlager cancellation on the one at the top right. That was posted in January of 1900 and it arrived in February of the same year. And then the Modest, modest Sprout um, two-line hand stamp is much scarcer. Most of the, it was in use between the 11th and the 14th of February with most of the actual usages taking place on the 14th of February. And alongside is the Uflaga ZAR cancellation for the same date. I think some of these uh, do have the whiff of contrivance about them, but um, show me any truly commercial items. One can argue that, well, if that's all there is, they were commercial items because they were sent um, through the postal system. Being besieged in Ladysmith, they ran short of certain provisions and there are auction lists uh, still in existence of items that were sold at auction and the prices are quite surprising for certain things. But one of the things they did run short of, of course, was meat. So they had plenty of horses around and they had to uh, resort to eating horse meat or horse flesh. And a lot of the soldiers didn't like it because I think even in those days, um, and we had a repeat of this a few years ago when we saw um, certain supermarkets were selling uh, burgers which, had, uh, which contained horse meat. And there was a fuss about this. Um, there were also some jokes that went around at the time. Uh, one of which I think was that Tesco's were thinking of selling a vegetarian version, um, which was known as a, a unicorn burger. Um, and uh, also there would be a special deal for motorists who, where they went to a supermarket complex, which uh, had a fuel station adjacent to the supermarket itself. And that if you refueled your car and you uh, bought burgers with horse meat in, then uh, there would be a special discount for you. And this special offer was known as only fuels and horses. So um, it emphasizes the fact that for many, many years, uh, the British public don't like doses of Dobbin in there uh, with their meat. So here, this uh, particular soldier who's writing to a major in the Grenadier Guards, we had a rough time of it, seven ounces of mealy meal per man per day and shells for dessert. And then, uh, the siege valentine card that was produced at the time in commemoration of the horse flesh diet called chevril uh, siege of ladysmith um, that depicted and i like the uh, cat here looking askance um, at the uh, little bag of chevril being carried by one of the soldiers one of the mounted soldiers that are there um, well it's a whole caricature isn't it and finally Life was awful up there. Small pieces of horse flesh, the whole lot being pig's food, but I've learned to eat it and enjoy it. Well, surprise, surprise. Okay, moving on then. How did the, was the um, siege of Ladysmith finally relieved? Well, reinforcements arrived and Buller eventually managed to find weaknesses in the Boer defenses and round the left flank of the Boer line, at Hussar Hill uh, and Monte Cristo, he managed to break through and cross the Tequila River to relieve the town of Ladysmith. And this is, although it's a modern map, it shows quite easily and clearly um, how the Boer lines were penetrated and Ladysmith was finally uh, relieved. Another one of uh, Ken Griffith's photographs in relief of Ladysmith, a contemporary photograph which shows very dramatically and clearly um, the relief column entering uh, part of Ladysmith. The Boer retreat. My apologies for the amount of text here. All these uh, slides will be on the website, so I'm not going to read this out. <laughs> You'll be glad to hear. But this was a cover that was intercepted by the British forces, and it's got a very late recorded date of the Uflaga uh, cancellation um, for 
the middle of 17th of May, 1900. And it's backstamp Johannesburg, 18th of May. And it was held in jo Joburg until British forces occupied the town at the end of the month. And then it was censored three months later and a label applied tied by the PBC past censor mark Johannesburg, 8th of August, 1900. So, and it was also censored and it's got the Danhauser oval, Boer oval uh, cancellation there. Boer retreat then took place as they went back virtually the way they, they'd come towards the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. And General Berger, who was in charge of a large section of the Boer forces, he re requested leave and presumably it was granted at the end of March. And Commandant Fure was uh, uh, replaced him as commander. And General Berger Lager hand stamps are uncommon. There's three recorded strikes uh, of this one in the top right hand corner. Uh, the one of Fours Lager is much fainter, but uh, again, there are only three examples of that recorded. The point here is that, of course, the Boers did what they could to continue to send mail during the retreat and they had to improvise with all sorts of cancellations. Temporary councillors were also used by the advancing British troops who reoccupied Natal. And a number of these were used for quite a long period of time into 1901 and, and indeed 1902. Um, the Elenslaka oval date stamp is one that's known and Coldfields Rail uh, in August of 1900. Further temporary uh, cancellations. The NFF2 circular cancellation in blue on the top right hand cover um, was used for quite a long, was used again after in 1901 as well as uh, it being started in late February and March of an early March of 1900. It's thought that the NFF2 mailbag seal, the intaglio seal on the left hand side, of which there are only some seven examples recorded, that was in use early March to early May. There's no specific evidence as to why it was brought into use. It was merely thought that it was used as a substitute because um, they were running out of other temporary hand stamps. The Bester's cancellation on the lower right hand side was used from 1900 into 1901. Um, and there are a number of those uh, cancels in, in circulation. Move on to a slightly different subject, um, recovered mail. When the Boers took over a town from the British, uh, frequently the stores were looted and they took what they could, leaving everything else behind that they didn't want. And there was an attack on Rudval Station. The British troops there were, were routed and the Boers sacked everything and took, took all that they needed. Um, mail was left behind. The Highlanders who arrived the following day um, searched amongst the debris of the uh, destroyed mailbags and any mail that was rescued was uh, or recovered was hand stamped um, and there are a variety of these hand stamps used on recovered mail and this one recovered from mails looted by the Boers on June the 8th. Um, pedants might argue that in fact the uh, looting took place on June the 7th and that the uh, hand stamp is incorrect but I, th I think that's uh, expecting too much uh, under the circumstances. Further items of, of looted mail, this one uh, a cachet with or two cachets on one envelope received without contents in the army post office and also recovered from mails looted by the enemy. They're known as separate cachets on covers, but um, there's a one cover at least with both cachets. There may be others in circulation. 
This um, one I particularly like that um, in September of 1900, when Lord Methuen was responsible for clearing the Western Transvaal, uh, some of the farmsteads that they went to, where they were found, uh, mail was found there. Most of it was collected up and um, in the Rustenburg uh, area and all the mail received the uh, cachet found in Rustenburg by British forces. And it's got uh, also resealing labels on it. Um, two of them have uh, original dated cancellations and also these uh, two resealing labels. As I said earlier that the British forces were not popular, whenever there was a, a reverse or a, a, a defeat of, of British troops, um, some of the journalists in the foreign newspapers and had a bit of a field day over this. And there was a debacle at Tweebosch where some inexperienced troops under the command of Lord Methuen were routed by um, a Boer force. Lord Methuen um, was not the best general and he was the only general to be captured by the Boers because he was shot in the knee at, at, at Tweebosch. Uh, he was also referred to by Winston Churchill as the general who could always be relied upon to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. And um, you can see the uh, postcard at the top um, with a rather obvious depiction of uh, King Edward VII getting a spanking from Kruger. And there's uh, Gladstone on the right and Chamberlain on the left, um, looking on, um, somewhat perturbed. And then uh, uh, a picture below of the uh, route of the troops at Tweebosch on the 7th of March, 1902. And just to complete the uh, there's a cover there um, from Lord Methuen, earlier cover, 1901, addressed to his wife, Lady Methuen, in, in, the, in England. Moving on then to uh, something a little bit lighter in subject, uh, an advertising envelope was produced uh, to publicise Dr. Williams' Pink Pills for Pale People positively cure rheumatism and it's a blood builder and nerve tonic and the stamp uh, on the right hand side um, with the army uh, post office South Africa cancellation conceals the full list of all the complaints that this uh, substance was uh, supposed to cure um, and I've, I've listed those below there but all the, the only thing that you can see on the envelope itself is this and all diseases peculiar to women uh, i don't think i'll make any further comment at all about that um this was an envelope of course sent by a soldier in the imperial yeomanry other illustrated envelopes a lot of troops were engaged on patrol duty and to uh stationed in, in blockhouses which were across the uh, the veldt and um, designed to monitor the movement of Boer forces and uh, alert British forces to deal with them as appropriate. They were bored and obviously needed to occupy their time um, and those who, with an artistic leaning produced uh, illustrated envelopes and some of these uh, were produced also in the UK. Uh, this one, news from the seat of war with Lord Roberts, who was in charge of the British forces applying pressure to uh, Paul Kruger. President Steen uh, escaping in his shirt. Um, President Steen location in a house was discovered by the British forces. And as the British went in through the front door, Steen escaped through the back door and uh, there's this cartoon of him escaping in his shirt uh, on, on horseback. There's a number of these addressed to the same person with different uh, comical uh, drawings on them. And finally, the last one, um, this is a particular favorite of mine. Um, I mentioned earlier about Christian de Vette and his recommendation as to how to deal with armored trains and the two goblins sitting under the toadstool keep out of de Vett. Um, I remember showing this to my great friend, 
Norton Collier uh, many years ago. And he collected uh, had numerous collections, and several of which were of a thematic um, variety. And one of them was fungi on stamps. And he asked me if I would sell him this particular cover. And uh, I had to politely decline his, his invitation. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for attending this this presentation. I'm sorry I didn't have everything in at, at uh, Abchurch Lane, but the great advantage is that members from overseas have been able to see it, um, a short a cut down version as a PowerPoint presentation. And I have to say that circumstances are such that we're going to have, we will be continuing these virtual presentations via Zoom once I've had an opportunity to revise parts of the programme which have been affected by the latest government uh, regulations and advice as far as the um, current circumstances uh, that we find ourselves in um, are likely to continue. Thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. Mark, I'll hand back to you now. Yes, thank you very much, Richard. And uh, thank you very much indeed for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to move to questions because um, Although I didn't mention it at the beginning, everybody, if you'd like to raise any questions, please do use the chat facility. With 103 of us on here, there's no way that I could be expected to look at all of you and see that you want to raise a question. So please be so kind as to put your question in the chat box. Uh, the chat box can be reached by putting your mouse over the, the uh, Zoom window where you can currently see a picture of Richard and the word chat is below him. Um, and when you click on that, you can then type your question in, in as a you know as a question in text. And the good news is, Richard, that we've had some questions coming in already. And the other good news is that some of our very learned colleagues um, have already answered them. But I will just quickly go through them so we can all get the benefit of the questions and answers. Okay. So, so Richard, we'll start with the easy ones, particularly ones that have already been answered. Um, you you showed a number of. Um, caches and other um, markings that had the uh, had the letters PK on them. And so the question was, what does PK stand for? Well, of course, our South African colleagues have uh, answered that. Of course, PK is post cantor. Post cantor. Yes, meaning post office. Mm. So that's what that one was. Um, now, on the subject of such um, abbreviations on, on mail, we saw a number of, of examples with, where you've got the, the, the letters PBC, that's Papa Bravo Charlie, PBC on there. And so the question from Robert Martin in Hawaii is, what does PBC stand for, please? Well, P stands for past, um, C for sensor. I think it's past base sensor. Okay, thank you. Um, you showed the uh, an example of the usage of a bag seal, which had this N NFF. Mm. You had a, an NFF2 intaglio marking. That's it. Um, what does NFF stand for? Robert would like to know that as well. Natal Field Force. Thank you very much. Right. I think those are the questions to do with abbreviations. Um, Ah, somebody wondered whether PBC stood for past by censor. Yes, it could be, mm, or past British censor. I've just seen come up on the that, screen. Right, that that was a suggestion from Frank and from Mike Elliott. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, a much more in, um, involved sort of question, really. Brian Livingstone asked this. You explained that the war made us aware of how popular, how, sorry, how unpopular. The British were with European forces, uh, European powers, I beg your pardon, right? The war made us aware of how unpopular we were with European powers. Mm. And it marked the end of British splendid isolation. So Brian's question to you is, what was the verdict on the captain of the armoured train? I don't think that it turned into a court martial. I think it was an inquiry. Um, there, I'm thinking back to another article that um, I've read 
that there was some misleading information given to him as to how he should conduct the operation that he was engaged in, in reconnoitering that part of the railway line uh, by train or that area through which the line passed um, by another uh, more senior officer. At the moment, I cannot remember exactly what the outcome of the inquiry was. Okay, but I'm, I feel confident that... Uh, that I'll, make some, I'll make a note of that and, yeah, and look uh, that one up. And if you'd like to uh, let Brian Livingston know by email, I'm sure he'd be delighted to receive a note from you. Okay. Um, Keith Klugman has joined us. Uh, I seem to recall, Keith, that you're over there in America. And of course, Richard, he says to you, thank you, Richard, from another Natal collector watching from Florida. Yes, I'm right, ah. I'm in Florida. And he also, Keith, you're not alone in saying, of course, great to get access to these talks. So yes, it's wonderful that you're able to join us there from Florida. Um, Paul Vinance uh, suggests <laughs> that that PBC is passed by censor. Uh, Hugh Amor down in South Africa, down in Cape Town, he says it's press-based sensor, he thinks. So we've got, we got a few ideas about what PBC stood for. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain because uh, I know that in other environments there were sensor marks that were uh, <coughs> base sensor. Um, yes. And they're written like that, not uh, just the initials. Yeah. So it need, I think it needs a bit of research, actually. Yes. Okay, well, that seems to be the last question that I'm seeing, unless someone throws in a few more at the moment. Um, Joan, Joan uh, Harmer has joined us from America, and uh, she says, thank you, Richard, it's wonderful. Um, so, yep, so thank you for that. Um, I think, Richard, you know, to be honest, that seemed to be the last question that, uh, that, that we've covered okay. off there. So I would like, on behalf of everybody... To say thank you very much it's um as we know it was a bit last minute this this change of plan but i think it's come together reasonably well um very interesting talk um i learned very much what i'd like to remind our our friends about is what you said earlier which is that actually your talk is it's actually being recorded now and this this will go up onto the website once i've uploaded it to <coughs> youtube You've also made available to us a handout, which is very interesting, very detailed. That is already on the website on the um, uh, next London meetings page. If you go to there and log in, um, as you know, members have access to more information than non-members. You'll find that there's, there's links there to Richard's handout document. And he's also uh, provided us with a six page uh, article about um, the the armored uh, the armored trains and, and the mail that was carried in that, which um, goes back to that question from from Brian Livingston as well. So thank you, Richard, for having put all of that together for us. It's been very interesting, and as as we often do with uh, with in fact as we try always to do with with our presenters, uh, we we like to send them a. Um, a document of showing your uh, showing our appreciation and um we have one prepared for you which i hope everybody can see so there we are that's presented by yourself to you, <laughs> to you. <laughs> well it's got your signature at the bottom and your yeah. yes i know um but mark yes. yes can you would you hand over to frank walton please I will indeed, yes. I will stop Thank you. sharing that and I'll hand over to Frank, of course. Um, can someone unmute Frank? Or Frank, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, over to you, Frank. Thank you. Um, you have, I must confess, Mark, you've actually pinched about 90% of my comments, but thank you anyway. <laughs> oh, well, sorry, but, but on you go, please. please. <laughs> I was... Uh, I was, I was minded just to reflect on the, the name dropping of Mr. Churchill, which I think uh, got in twice. But the one that resonated today, Richard, was um, you mentioned you were quoting uh, Churchill uh, regarding Methuen, um, where you said that he uh, snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, 
I have to say, today you've done the exact opposite. Uh, you've certainly uh, triumphed today, Richard, and given the, uh, the least the 24 hours notice you have for putting this show on, uh, I think it's been an absolute uh, magnificent triumph, so thank you very much indeed. Um, I was particularly taken with the, the great variety you've put into the PowerPoint uh, with the cartoons and the, uh, the maps, etc., etc. It's a great lesson to everybody following you how to do such an event. So as ever, your, um, your comments were snappy, the personal issue was wonderful, the storytelling was great. So thank you very much indeed from everybody who's had the, the privilege of joining you today. So well done, thank you. Thank you, Frank, for your very kind words. Thank you, Frank. Right. Um, well, Mr. President, shall we say that this is the end of the more formal part of this? And yes. In which case I will stop recording. Um, and we can then have an informal session. So I'm going to stop recording. Here I go.